Today we present a story set in a diva of cinema, one of the best that Hollywood has had and is Elizabeth Taylor. About this great actress some particularities have been highlighted, but in our biography we will be telling you the hardest biography of Elizabeth Taylor. The addictions, her father's jealousy because she earned more, so much so that one day, he punched her that damaged her tempo jaw joint forever, like the one of her husband's causing her a miscarriage and much more. Actually, sometimes we only see the dream of their characters on screen and we think that these celebrities are all pink and it turns out that within so much life and feasting, there is a world full of darkness and sadness. Without further ado, we will continue with the story. But first, follow US, like US and leave your comments, as they may add more information to the biography of Elizabeth Taylor's life. Elizabeth Taylor. The strength and glamour of an icon, he was born on February 27, 1932, in London. She was the younger of two children of Frances Len Taylor and Sarah Southern, who were originally from Arkansas. Frances Taylor was an art dealer and Sarah was a former actress whose stage name was Sarah Southern. She was born with a double edge of eyelashes, hairy on her back, arms and ears and took ten days to open her eyes. But when she did, a violet gaze dazzled art dealer Frances Taylor and former actress Sarah Southern, parents of what would become one of the most photographed women of the 20th century. Elizabeth Taylor, it was 1932. Elizabeth Taylor debuted at the age of nine in Hollywood with the film There's One Born Every Minute in 1942, but it was not until he premiered a date with Judy, at the age of 16, that he became a reference. A reference of adolescent style. The person responsible for this transformation was Helen Rose, the costume designer of the film. The violet dress, matching the actress's eyes, made of chiffon and lace that she wears in a scene from the musical inspired by a radio show was replicated thousands of times by the American department store. He had a movie life. From wearing the Pilgrim Pearl of the Bourbons, from having a yacht named Calisma an acronym for Kate, Liza and Maria, daughters of Taylor Burton, from converting to Judaism for love and from buying the Krupp diamond that belonged to the Nazi Krupp industrialists, even suffering mistreatment. Her father drank and couldn't stand the fact that his daughter, 12 years old, earned more money than him after becoming a star with Fire of Youth 1944. On one occasion he punched him so badly in the jaw that the temporomandibular joint was damaged forever. With her first spouse, Nikki Hilton, she lived a nightmare. They seemed so happy that MGM took the opportunity to promote Father of the Bride 1950, but at the age of 18 he discovered the emotional hecatomb. On their honeymoon, Hilton kicked her in the stomach which caused her to miscarry. Taylor didn't even know she was pregnant. I could even see the baby in the toilet, he would write in his diaries. These unpublished and tragic episodes are reflected in the authorized biography Elizabeth Taylor. The Strength and Glamour of an Icon Dome Books by Kate Anderson Brower. At the age of three and a half, Taylor made her recital debut. In the audience were Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. With World War II, the Taylors emigrated from London to Los Angeles where Sarah channeled the frustration of not having been a well-known actress through her daughter, who debuted at the age of ten in There's One Born Every Minute. Who would have thought that, two decades later, she would become the first actress to charge a million dollars for Cleopatra in 1963, on the set of which she fell in love with Richard Burton while she was still married to singer Eddie Fisher and he to Sybil Williams. The end of the marriage to Fisher was described as a slow suicide, as he tried to control and manipulate her in gruesome ways. One night, he grabbed a gun, started fiddling and told her, I'm not going to kill you. I'd never shoot you. You're too beautiful. To talk about Taylor's cinematography is to talk about his privacy. Almost every film is marked by something, drunkenness, surgical operations to save her life, feminist messages, depression, fights with children. Taylor was always clear, I mother courage. I will reach old age dragging my sable coat. In his home there were terrible moments. His son Christopher Wilding says that one day his mother called him to his room and that, when he entered, he found her with a syringe with Demerol narcotic analgesic opiate. She asked him to inject it into his leg, but he refused, I was kind of out of breath and told her that I was sorry, but that I couldn't help her with it. Another hard moment occurred in 1983, when she was admitted to the Betty Ford Detox Center for the first time. During therapy, Elizabeth confessed that she had felt used by the studio, by Richard Burton and by her family to enrich herself at the expense of her fame. Her parents spent almost all the money she earned as a child and adolescent prodigy and even her mother, Sarah, paid a doctor to confirm if she was still a virgin with the excuse of opening her hymen so that her first time would not be painful. 
the diva revealed in therapy that her son Christopher had asked her for financial help on several occasions. At that moment I felt mortified and ashamed. My mind was racing after this revelation that for me was like a bomb, his son recounts in the book. He is her second child, the result of her marriage to her second spouse, actor Michael Wilding, to whom Taylor was unfaithful with Frank Sinatra and with whom she became pregnant. She wanted to marry the voice and he responded with a trip to Mexico to have an abortion. Christopher and his sister, Liza Todd, are sources for Taylor's new biography. The only daughter she had with Mike Todd, the producer of Around the World in 80 Days 1956, says that the service did not let her go to her mother's room in the mornings so that she would not see her high. Liza always missed having confidences between mother and daughter. Sometimes, all of a sudden, you realized that you were the only person your mother was being protected from. That drove me crazy. Intelligent, with an easy laugh, empathetic, self-critical, self-destructive. Taylor was also an influencer before the term was coined. During the filming of Cleopatra in 1961, she helped raise the profile of Volgari and catapulted an unknown designer named Valentino to fame from whom she asked for an evening gown for the premiere of Spartacus in Rome. Seeing it in photos, the high society ladies wanted to dress up in the brand. In addition, he was the first star that celebrity used to change the perception of AIDS and homosexuals, and he created the first foundation to raise funds for research. Most of his friends were gay. In fact, it led to Roddy McDowell and Montgomery Clift being a couple. Taylor and her husbands, married for the first time in 1950, she was 18 years old and eager to escape family control. The lucky suitor was Conrad Nicholson Hilton, heir to the important hotel empire baptized with his surname and Paris great-uncle. The unfortunate marriage lasted almost nine months. They separated after Nicky caused an abortion, with a kick, to the actress whom he abused, physically and psychologically, since the genesis of their union. There are those who argue that the wedding was a maneuver by Metro Goldwyn Mayer to advertise father of the bride in stage, both in fiction and in real life, Liz's passage from girl to woman. Without learning a lesson from the experience, a year after her first divorce Elizabeth married Michael Wilding. She was 20 years old and the British actor was twice her age, as in the couplet Nomi Kieres Tanto by Quintero, Leon and Quiroga. Wilding was more of a father to the actress than a husband, but unlike the previous one, he did not seem to be jealous of Taylor's successes and they treated each other with respect. In love or not, the union lasted five years and they had two sons, Michael and Christopher. To Elizabeth's personal biography must be added, Michael ex-husband and Michael's son, Michael, third consort in 1957. Taylor and Mike Todd said, I do, on February 2nd in the port of Acapulco, Mexico. The film and theater producer was powerful, successful, virile, and a good lover. With him she realized, for the first time, the type of man who really managed to make her vibrate. There was a strong sexual attraction between them and good harmony inside and outside the bed that helped the artist to gain self-confidence, to empower themselves, to take charge of his life and, in part, of his career. She started dressing sexier. She was no longer the offspring of the movies, nor the victim of her first husband, nor the demure daughter of the second. Widowed for the first and last time in her life, Elizabeth went to live with her three children at the home of her best friend, actress Debbie Reynolds. She needed to mourn accompanied by an adult who would offer her comfort, and she found it on the shoulder of the one baptized as the Bride of America. Friction arouses desire. It didn't take long for Liz to fall in love with her colleague's husband, singer Eddie Fisher, who had been both like a brother to the late spouse. The scandal was huge. It had been a little more than a year since Mike's tragic end. Taylor and Fisher legalized their esteem on May 12, 1959, at the Beth Shalom Synagogue in Las Vegas. In 1961, and after three consecutive nominations without a happy ending, the British-American of American origin received her first Oscar as Best Leading Actress for her role in A Marked Woman. In fiction, Taylor plays Gloria, a model of disorderly life who surrenders to the wrong married man in order to return to the path of irreproachable moralizing. Despite her extraordinary beauty, Liz imposed herself to play dramatic profiles in an industry, that of cinema, which relegated the beautiful to troop roles. Taylor hated this film. She was convinced that it was a way to publicly humiliate her for the peculiar circumstances in which she had fallen in love with Eddie. He was right. Elizabeth had decided to leave Metro to film Cleopatra with the 20th Century Studios, a choice that did not sit well with the Lions Production Company that forced her to shoot this drama as revenge before ending their working relationship. 
Elizabeth began working on the filming of Cleopatra in 1962. Richard Burton, who played Mark Antony, and the protagonist of the very expensive film had barely met before at some events in Hollywood when she fell in love with him during the recording of the first joint scene in Rome. Burton was hung over and his hands were shaking. Taylor helped him put a cup of coffee in his mouth and then, I thought, wow, it turns out that he is human. So vulnerable, sweet, trembling and giggling easily. The actress said years later. The spark of romance jumped immediately and immediately the fuse of scandal was lit. Both were married. Liz with Eddie Fisher and Richard with Sybil Williams, who had already forgiven her spouse dozens of infidelities with as many co-stars. They could have kept their relationship a secret but preferred to air it. Nobody gave a penny for them. They called each other everything and they did not always do it with respect. They were a couple of three. Drink was the faithful and recurring lover in which the two took refuge. Sometimes together and sometimes separately. They quenched their thirst with spirits from breakfast time. They married on March 15, 1964 during a very intimate ceremony held at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Montreal, Canada, in which Elizabeth was dressed in yellow defying all kinds of superstition. It was his fifth marriage. They divorced in June 1974 after a decade of hurting each other a lot, but also a lot of good. She helped him to accept that he suffered from mild hemophilia and not to hide his homosexual relationships from the past, and he revered her as a woman and as an interpreter. Together they adopted a daughter, Maria, and shot eleven films. They did not know how to be together, but they did not consent to live apart either. I can't live without you. You are everything to me, the air I breathe, my blood, my mind, my imagination, Burton wrote to Liz in a letter after they got into the millionth fight. They married for the second time in October 1975 in Botswana, only accompanied by those whom the actress specified as her own. On July 29, 1976, they were legally free again. When he died of a stroke in 1984, she concluded that they had lacked time to get back together. The Welsh actor was the great love of her life. Elizabeth didn't know how to live alone, it's that she liked to live with someone else. Or so he thought. On December 4, 1976, he legally joined his destiny, five months after his first date, to that of Republican Senator John Warner. She had secured a divorce from Burton on July 29th of that same year. The cat with the violet eyes married for the eighth and last time in 1991 to Larry Fortensky. They had met during a retreat at the Betty Ford. Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch, which acted as godfather, was an exceptional witness to this controversial wedding. She was 20 years older than him. Photojournalists parachuted in to get a photo of the ceremony. She was dressed in ecru lace signed by Valentino. Liz divorced the construction worker six years later, he said, because he felt trapped in a golden cage. In 1993 was also the last time Taylor won an Oscar, known as Gene Hersholt, although this was not awarded for his acting merits but for his fight to eradicate HIV and the defense of the rights of those affected by this disease. He became aware of the seriousness of the situation after the death of his friend Rock Hudson in 1985. That same year he founded, together with a group of doctors and scientists, the American Foundation for AIDS Research. On October 31, 1992, Elizabeth Taylor received the Prince of Asturias Award, now the Princess for Concord, at the Campo Amor Theater in Oviedo. She did so as a co-founder of AMFAR, the American Foundation for AIDS Research. Elizabeth Taylor's health was always fragile. She was hospitalized more than 70 times, injured her back five times and had both hips replaced. At the end of her days, the osteoporosis she suffered from forced her to move around in a wheelchair. She dressed in caftans and adorned her neckline with the most varied gems. She died at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, at the age of 79, from heart failure surrounded by her four children. He lived many more lives than he was able to dream of when he and his family left Europe at war in search of a peaceful destiny.